What's up guys, Nathan here. Today I want to talk about the one simple poker strategy that drastically improved my poker results and I think it will help you guys out too. Now it's something you might have heard of before. It's called bluffing. Yes, bluffing. Now let me explain. One of the biggest reasons why people do not get the success that they want at the poker tables is because either they don't bluff enough or they do it really poorly, often the latter. As you guys can see here, I've got a hand lined up at small stakes cash game, $50 buy-in. I'm gonna walk you through exactly how to run a proper big bluff in this game successfully. Now, why do people often bluff poorly? It's because they do not tell a believable story. Guys, you need to understand that a bluff is essentially a fairy tale that you're telling someone, and the whole point is to get them to believe your story and ultimately fold their hand. That's how you're gonna know if you've told a good story or not. So telling good stories like this, guys, honestly is the biggest difference between the handful of uh, professional poker players that you've probably seen that are, you know, seem to be winning all the money all the time, travel in the world, they've got the gold bracelet, millions of dollars, and everybody else who has their dreams in this game, but the vast majority of them, let's be honest, you know, never get beyond break even or somewhere around there. But I'm gonna teach you how to use this simple bluffing strategy step by step in this video. So let's jump right into it. All right, as I mentioned, I've got a hand lined up here from a $50 buy-in cash game online. The blinds are 25 cent, 50 cent and we have a suited connector, eight, seven of diamonds. So let's jump right into this hand. All right, so it folds around to seat six. Now, who is seat six? Now, the first thing we always wanna be doing in poker is understanding who we're playing against. Now, if you play online poker, you can just use something like a HUD that'll put numbers on your screen and tell you what type of player you're up against. Uh, this player is playing a 17-14-2, that's VPI, PPFR, and aggression factor. Once again, if you want to know what these HUD stats refer to, how to get them on your screen, there'll be links to everything in the description below. But even if you don't use a HUD, maybe you play live poker, maybe you play online at a site that doesn't have a HUD, you need to be paying attention to the player type you're up against. Now, a 17 14 2 is a tag player, a tight and aggressive type of player. But again, if you're not using a HUD, you can still be paying attention to who's at your table and understanding the player type you're up against. So tight and aggressive players are definitely are one of my biggest targets to bluff in the smaller stakes games because they tend to not want to go all the way with a hand. They tend to uh, kind of play really aggressively early on in the hand, pre-flop and on the flop. But a lot of players like this at the lower stakes in particular tend to get a little bit gun shy if you start shoving big amounts of money into them, especially on the turn and river. So it folds to us on the button. And once again, we have a nice little suit of connector, eight, seven of diamonds. So what should we be doing in a spot like this? Well, you know, flatting is completely fine here. Well, I would say that if you're confident in your post flop abilities, that you do wanna be getting involved in a situation like this, either by calling or raising, as I'm gonna discuss in a minute. Because the thing is, guys, the only way to make money in poker is to get involved. Now, if we had eight deuce offsuit or something crappy like that, obviously we're not going to be getting involved. So we obviously wanna have some standards. You know, a hand like a, a pseudo connector like this with the power of position, remember we're on the button, I think is going to be a situation where we can look to turn a profit. So. Now, if you guys have read my second book, Modern Small Stakes, you know that I use a lot of frequencies and sort of ratios for what decisions I make in a spot like this. And I will say for me, this is roughly a 50-50 spot where essentially 50% of the time I'm flatting here and 50% of the time I'm re-raising. The reason I wanna do this is because against decent thinking opponents like this, tight and aggressive kind of regulars, I wanna be mixing up my play so that they can never get a specific read on me. Should mention that I'm also going to be mixing it up here with stronger hands like ace king and ace queen as well. So it's not like I just do this with suited connectors. This is kind of a topic for an entirely different video, so I don't wanna go off on a tangent, but I just want you guys to know that I'm going to choose to re-raise in this hand, but a full 50% of the time, I actually would just flat here as well. We're gonna go through this hand as played with a re-raise. Now, the great thing about a re-raise pre-flop is it opens up a lot more pathways for us to win the pot after the flop. 
we've gained back the power of initiative of aggression here, meaning that we're in the driver's seat and the onus is back on him to make a big hand. So there are pros and cons of flatting and three betting here, and that's definitely one of the pros of playing the hand in the more aggressive manner as we chose to do in this situation. All right, so both of the blinds get out of the way and it's back on seat six, and he decides to make the call, so let's go to the flop. All right, so the flop comes with a 4-3-10 uh, with one diamond on the board there. Uh, it's not really a great flop for us in any way. I mean, we have a backdoor diamond draw. We have got a backdoor straight draw. But besides that, we don't really have anything. But you know, the thing is in poker, guys, is most of the time nobody really has anything. And that's why we're talking about bluffing here, because we need to find ways to win pots when we don't have anything. That's how we're going to get ahead in this game. So let's see what seat six decides to do first. He decides to check. So what should we be doing in a spot like this? Well, you know, we've already re-raised pre-flop. We've shown strength. So what we wanna be doing on a dry, uncoordinated board like this is just continuing to keep our foot on the gas pedal keep applying the pressure by making a standard continuation bet here. Guys, you only need to make it about 50% of the pod, maybe a little bit more as you see, you know, 60%, whatever, somewhere in that range is totally fine. We don't want to be blasting the pot in a situation like this. And the reason why is because we make smaller bet sizes like this, we can maintain our aggression a lot more frequently in lower stakes games with a wide range of hands. All right, so what does seat six decide to do? He decides to make the call. All right, so what are we gonna be putting him on at this point? Well, again, let's walk ourselves through the hand. He decided to raise preflop, then he decided to call our three bet, and he's now calling our C bet on the flop on a dry board like this. Well, I'm gonna say that his hand really uh, sort of feels like a, you know, a pocket queens, a pocket jacks, maybe an ace 10 pocket nines, pocket eights, something in the sort of middling variety there. What is the reasoning behind this? Well, I think that if he had a hand like pocket aces, pocket kings, something really, really big or ace king, he would have made another re-raise preflop. So I think that we can discount most of those hands from his range. I also think that he might decide to, uh, to raise us on the flop if somehow he was slow playing those hands. Now on the flip side, I don't think he's going to have a whole lot of hands like King Queen and King Jack and a lot of his, uh, say, pocket fives and pocket sixes because I think a lot of those hands are going to fold right now versus our flop continuation bet. So I'm squarely putting him on some of those sort of middling strength hands that are kind of like, okay, well, I kind of got something, but it's not the nuts. And so the reason I wanted to mention this is because it's going to play a large role in our decision making later on in the hand. All right, so let's go to the turn. So the turn comes with the king. Now let's see what seat six decides to do first. He does check, so it's back on us. So what should we be doing here? Like I mentioned off the top, guys, the key to a successful bluff in poker is a believable story. And one of the biggest keys to your success in that is a good board runout. You need cards that smack your perceived range. If you've read my first book, Crush on the Microstakes, you'll know what a perceived range is. It's basically what range of hands your opponent thinks you have based on your preflop actions. Now remember, we re-raise preflops. So our perceived range here is going to be strong hands like ace-king, ace-queen, Pocket aces, pocket kings, pocket queens, basically strong hands with strong Broadway cards like, you know, a king in them. So this is an excellent card for us to continue barreling on, to continue telling a good story based on our perceived range. It's exactly what we decide to do. Once again, you don't need to bet a large amount here. We want to be making a little bit on, more on the small side in a situation like this so that we can make this same play with a wide variety of hands. So seat six does make the call. And at this point, you know, we have to put them on something reasonably strong. You know, this is really starting to feel at this point like a pocket jacks that's desperately hanging on that didn't like to see that king but isn't ready to fold quite yet. Uh, because I think that if this player did have some sort of nut hand, they would have shown up with a raise or something at this point. But the river card especially is going to heavily influence our decision making. All right, so with all that said, let's go see a river. 
So the river comes with the ace of clubs. Now guys, this is the absolute perfect card for us to empty the clip and go for the full triple barrel bluff. First of all, let's see what seat six decides to do. He does indeed check and so it's on us. Now, why is this the perfect spot to run the big bluff? Basically, for all of the reasons that I've mentioned so far throughout this hand, we have a perfect believable story here. We re-raise preflop, which gives us a perceived range of a lot of big Broadway heavy hands like ace king, pocket aces, pocket kings, and we got the perfect board run out to represent those hands. Also, based on his decision making throughout the hand, playing it passively at all stages, we already discussed how his hand feels a lot like one of those middling strength kind of hands, a pocket queens, a pocket jacks, maybe an ace 10, something like that. Something that's just desperately hanging on that really, really doesn't want to play for stacks here. So with all of that said, I think that this is the perfect spot to go for the triple barrel bluff. That's exactly what we do. And now is the time to ship it all in the middle to make sure that he's going to have to call a large amount, 75% of the pot this time or closer to around there in order to get to a showdown. We're not going to make it cheap for him. And after a lot of humming and hawing, this player did in fact decide to throw his hand away and ship the $43 pot to us. So guys, this in a nutshell is how you run a successful bluff in the lower limit games. Well, number one, you need to pick the right players. First off, you don't wanna be doing this kind of thing versus most recreational players because they're just gonna call you down. You wanna be doing this against the tighter kind of regular opponents, the tight and aggressive players, the tight passive players. These are gonna be some of your most common opponents in these games, as I talk about in my latest poker book. And these are the kind of players who do not like to stick all their money in the middle without a very, very strong hand. So the very obvious exploitative counter to that is to run big bluffs against them while telling a believable story. It's always important that you're telling a believable story when you're bluffing, this is one of the biggest mistakes people make when they do bluff, is they pick bad situations. I hope that my analysis in this hand helped you guys understand based on our perceived range before the flop, what kind of hands is he putting us on? And then based on the board run out, is that a good board for our perceived range? With the king and the ace, that's the most classic two scare cards in the deck that are excellent for pre-flop three better aggressor like us. Anyways, as always, I want to know what you guys think. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Number one, how often do you bluff at the poker tables? And when you do it, are you really looking for board runouts? Are you looking at player types? What is your plan when you make a bluff? Or are you just, you know, clicking buttons and pushing chips in the middle like most people do and getting your bluffs called too much. Either way, let me know your thoughts on that in the comments below. And if you guys enjoy watching poker strategy videos like that, make sure you shove all in on that like button below as it just helps me out. And also consider subscribing to the channel here because I'm putting out high level poker strategy videos like this every single week to help you guys out, help you start winning more in the games that you're actually playing in lower stakes games like this, not that million dollar pots like they teach in every other YouTube video. The games that you guys are actually playing in, I'm giving you the tips to actually help you guys start winning more consistently. And lastly, if you wanna know my complete strategy to start crushing small stakes poker games like this, make sure you grab a copy of my free poker cheat sheet. It's called Massive Profit at the Micros. That'll be the top link in the description below. You can read it in about an afternoon. It'll give you my step-by-step -step strategy to start finally crushing these kind of games. All right, guys, that's about all I got for this one. I'll leave another video up here that I think will help you guys out that I made recently, and I'll catch you in the next one. This has been Nathan Williams with BlackRain79.com. Thank you.